Hi, this is Privateer Station, and today we are bringing you day 227 of Ukraine War Diaries as Mark and Alexei discuss what happened on the Crimean Bridge. Done in the usual conversational format between Alexei Rostovich, advisor to the office of the President of Ukraine, and Mark Fagan, Russian opposition journalist. Enjoy. Dear friends, I'm glad to see you all on Fagan Live. It is Saturday, 8th of October. Time is one minute past ten in Kiev, and we are doing another stream, day 227, with Alexei Rostovich. Glad to see you, Alexei. Good evening. Right, 132,000 watching us, and they're rather curious, you know. They're rather curious, why did you blow up the bridge? Wait, Mark, perhaps you've done it. Well, okay. Maybe, maybe not even us. Don't put all the responsibility on my frail shoulders. Well, sometimes we can, right? Just, you know, go and accuse without any by any basis for that. I think uh, your arguments that they will be protecting the bridge were rather strong, but uh, this explosion appear appear to reveal different interesting aspects of that. What I'm concerned about, uh, let's imagine that uh, the version, which uh, doesn't mean is correct, that it was a truck that had explosives that exploded uh, on the bridge, but, and they're saying there was a lot of explosives on the truck, but is it possible with the truckload to just uh, get these uh, flights of that bridge uh, up in the air and topple them down. Well, I don't think it's designed to withstand 500 or several tons in one place, especially if it is a shaped or directional explosion. So, if we do take their official version, there was a big truck driving, could be up to nine tons of explosives in that. Nine tons? Yes. Or something like that. This is a dark forest, I understand, and of course everybody is uh, explosives experts now on, online and discussing all everything. I, I mean, not me, not me. I know a little bit about explosives and I'm definitely not an expert. Right, so we know two things that uh, Two flights collapsed, and we know that partially a railroad uh, track was also damaged. By the way, they just announced that the first uh, cargo train has already passed. Uh, will not be so easy with an automobile. The side of the bridge, they already showed some of the vehicles crossing it, but those were light uh, sedans, understandably tanks, will not likely to be used the automobile bridge. And probably it might take, you know, on a quickie they could pull them up or fix something in about a week. But uh, if you do proper engineering evaluation, that'll take much longer. This bridge is a bit special because uh, the columns are of a different height and it, you, one would need to correct to estimate uh, if the column was damaged, if, if it changed its alignment or anything. So that's a tricky part. If you do it Putin style, you can yeah quickly fix that, patch it. Uh, perhaps uh, they'll need to get engineers, uh, detach the flights that are hanging, uh, bring equipment, perhaps one or two weeks to get it back. Cargo volume dropped at least twice at the very basic estimation. So this is already a good uh, achievement. This is a good result of that event. We did speak about it before. We did mention that it is very difficult to destroy it. So here we observe that they got several tons of explosives right at the place. And did they destroy it? No, the bridge the bridge still stands, but at least now we know how it reacts to these uh, interactions. We know what a uh, certain amount of explosives can cause to that bridge. So that was a sort of a check, if you want, 
And ton of bridge was also checked several times before uh, it was really seriously hit. Yeah, but ton of bridge does show that it's a sturdier bridge, right? So you think Crimean they've stolen a bit more? It's weaker, yes. Um, Anton of Bridge got 140, 120 HIMARS in it, and still some of the sedans can cross it, uh, albeit very carefully, but they can still do that. And here, just one truck, and off we go. So we did figure that under a certain if you produce a certain effect on that, uh, the flights will start toppling, right? Yeah, we observed that. But I think what's more interesting here is who exploded that. Okay, okay, we'll talk about that too. We uh, actually did uh, listen to Podolak's version, who published uh, that just recently. And you allow that Ukraine is not taking responsibility. And, you know, it's Ukraine, sovereign state. You won't take responsibility. You do it. You don't. You don't. You don't. You're not obliged. You know, Russia was uh, claiming there's nobody there. There's no, there are no hours there when they were taking Crimea. And now all of a sudden they would ask for authorization, right? So his idea is that this is... Uh, FSB and Minister of Defense duking it out over that bridge. What do you think about it? In Moscow there were interesting things today. Shoigu uh, did a salto and uh, appointed Suravikin to run this operation in uh, Ukraine. Is it his purview? In Russia, yeah, he can appoint a person. A uh, president can also do that, but they did issue an order to appoint Surovikin as the boss. And there were some bureaucratic uh, motions happening that Dzerzhinsky division was uh, called up on alarm and uh, driven into Moscow. And uh, some people, some sources are saying they were arresting some of the top uh, military officials. Other sources said they were just training. So we'll, we'll know in a few days what actually unfolded in Moscow today. Um, another thing is that the bridge security is FSB. And when they were about to grasp the throat of military and start stifling them, they got a big punch with that bridge. So now they're both equidistant from Putin's uh, throne again. The bridge was uh, a crown jewel of Putin's reign and blowing it up on his birthday, his favorite toy is uh, definitely, has definitely affected his mood. An interesting thing is that they almost completely lack accusation of Ukraine. They were just standard statement, something brief posted, and that's about it. No serious uh, interviews, no serious conferences, no serious accusations of Ukraine. So I'm suspecting in the near future they'll be trying to figure it out which of them uh, did that. And I think they will uh, end up with the version... Uh, actually, I think I can predict where they'll end up being. I think they're playing 1905, the loss in war, and... Uh, Security people, FSB essentially, are trying to, like in Akunin's uh, movie, they're trying to, or book, um, they're, they're trying to scare the leadership a little bit. Um, and it does appear that the part of uh, Russian top that has relation to the power struggle figured that the leadership has lost, is losing control and they don't see exit out of the current situation. And they need to concentrate their effort on the fight for power and the fight for the future of the country when their current Führer will be no more. And they, after today, I think this will be a dividing milestone between external orientation in this war Russia of Russia to the internal orientation. I have a feeling that their towers are starting to collapse inwards. 
and those people who are in power, both uh, who are who have enough power to make decisions and those who actually are decisive enough to make decisions. And they, I think they're starting to understand that the Russian internal agenda is uh, a more pressing issue or getting to getting ahead of any other issue right now because they understand that they have lost this war and um, the outcome will matter who will retain their power, who will have more resources. So I would uh, totally take the blow up of that bridge as one part of Kremlin uh, fights against the other. And they're fighting for different scenarios of power separation within Russia. I think this version has more legs than the other one when some Ukrainian intel figured a way to put uh, explosives on a truck and get it on the bridge and explode it. With all the control system they have in place, although it's hard to tell right now fully with 100% probability, this is more of a theory. For me, Moscow's story and Moscow trace in that could have been ours, could have been some third force, whatever, who exploded the bridge. The most important feature of that event is that we lack the reaction in the format of standard procedures. There is no statement from Ministry of Defense, there is no signal from Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, what we see though is they are raising a division and uh, on, a, on an alarm and uh, bring it into Moscow. So it does appear like internal fight, internal struggle within Russia. I think this topic is becoming more prominent from what I see. And this is good, that, that means the end is nigh, much faster than we were expecting it in this fight. All right, uh, there are actually two factors that are pouring water onto that wind, on the, onto that mill. Let's see, I, I would not subscribe to any of them, you know. First of all, these things happened before. They were exploding buildings in 99. Remember Rizansky Sugar? And they used a double agent, agent Achimez Gachiaev, to do that. So they did not have any ethical problem with that. Especially this time they were exploding the bridge. Uh, not people, and frankly they don't care about people. They, you know, they can kill as many as they want to. And here it's an uh, inanimate object, bridge, even easier. So, second thing they state is that it was an explosive of a truck. They even found the driver. They show a picture of the driver. He's a Muslim guy from Krasnodar region. And that's another hook for them, because they can easily, if anything, fall back and say, oh, this is uh, ISIS. And we've heard uh, things like that before in different situations. That's an opportunity to walk it back and say, okay, this version didn't fly. Let's just uh, bring Islamic version here. It's not us, it's not Ukrainians, it's some third force that done it. Yeah, somebody crawled here from Syria. And that's what they did kind of in uh, Crimea when they were investigating some of the explosions. They actually blamed the third party. So that's on one hand. On the other, let's let's imagine that Minister of Defense decided indeed to blow this bridge up a little and show that CFSB doesn't really work well as well. Stop blaming us, it's not just us. This is a sort of uh, balancing it out. Because if they want to save themselves, if there is uh, any desire to preserve their careers and lives, they do understand that somebody needs to be sacrificed. Their propagandists are screaming, it's time to punish somebody, and Shoigu is number one in that list, not just him. But if you also look at the other versions, could Ukraine have any weapon? That's one of the versions when people are uh, seeing these sparkles on the video and there were several explosions. Could it be a hit from any of the missiles or any other tools that Ukraine possibly has? 
No, it would be different, Mark. The character of explosion would be different. What's the difference? Have you seen the video? The volume of that explosion? Not there, I don't know any missile that can produce such an effect. The scale, yeah, the scale is different. The direction is different. And missile is visible. There is not a missile that you cannot see when it uh, hits. It has to be, I don't know, some hypersonic, but even on the lower levels of atmosphere, you still catch that on video. So cameras would still get it in one of the frames. So all these explosives, floating barges with explosives, that's all uh, BS. Um, that's a different thing here. Okay, we have uh, three sides, FSB, military, and Kadyrov. FSB is in favor, because if you want to punish military, that's FSB, right? Military don't care about Shoigu, because he is out of system figure. They do care about themselves, though. I would remind that uh, military people are not just the commanders of tank divisions. It's also military intel, GRU, and they have different capabilities. So this event is a big hit on FSB right now. Now Bortnikov needs to explain how on the birthday of the leader he failed to protect his uh, favorite crown jewel. And military can now point finger at FSB and say, well, yeah, the front at Kherson and Zaporozhye folded because FSB could not protect the bridge and we didn't get enough logistics. Because if not the bridge, we could have held the front and uh, they did not help us to do that. Oh, you think that's uh, that an angle? That uh, basically make FSB a patsy for the folding of the southern front? Yeah, definitely. You can look at it this way and uh, they could blame FSB back and say you failed our supply lines. You did not preserve them. So go look for the ones responsible. We'll see that in the near time. It'll be unfolding in, as I usually say, two or three weeks. But we'll see where the game in Moscow will be played, too. On one of the versions, Zolotov was supposed to be appointed the Minister of Defense instead of Shoigu, but he hates Kadyrov from Chechen times, from the times he fought there. Because uh, back then, they were cut heads of soldiers and officers that Chechens did. And these things are not forgiven. Then uh, we also heard that Suravikin was going to be ahead uh, of Minister of Defense, but Suravikin was sent now to command the Ukrainian operation. And uh, he's an interesting figure. Sometimes he surprises me with his dumb decisions, so that's uh, somewhat a good decision for us. Do you think it could be any UAV or anything that attacked the road? Because you know that explosive when there was a train passing by with uh, fuel, because matching the explosion with the uh, canisters with the cisterns on the train passing by, that was good timing. It's not accidental, right? I do not believe in UAVs and some horrible missiles or some magic weapons. And what UAV or missile can fly in? This area is supposedly the most protected part of the world. I don't know if the White House defenses can match what they're doing with that. What, how much effort do they have around this bridge? They have uh, two brigades covering it and ships, and uh, they even mentioned some battle dolphins or whatever. So what do you, you can talk about? All right, we're just trying to figure it out for the posterity and entertain different uh, theories because uh, Moscow cruiser, Crimean bridge and the uh, toppling of the front on the Kharkov region and you know giving up Liman and other parts. What impression does it produce on those uh, Russians who are in the trenches in Kherson in the south? Oh yeah, Kherson group is uh, pretty sad at the moment because they do understand this is about their supplies because bringing it by land from Rostov uh, 
by Mariupol and Melitopol, this is rather difficult, especially when our HIMARS can reach it. And we reach things there. One of the proofs that uh, yesterday Ilovaisk got hit, it's a big uh, railroad junction. Something flew in there, something hit it, uh, and there was a ton of explosions, a lot of fire and a lot of things broken there. So that's the proof. That route is a big problem. Okay, for example, their railroad bridge will be functioning in the Crimea, but the automobile line that was also being heavily used, and a lot of equipment came on its own, you know, they were actually driving them. There were several nights when they're, very often when they were closing the bridge and they were getting the military reinforcements through the bridge, so they had military equipment driving on their, with its own wheels and trucks, tracks. Um, and a 25-ton truck uh, pulling something is considered to be heavy equipment. This is a problem, and I think they do understand that uh, their supply lines were pretty slow, and now they're becoming thin, and we're inter doing intercepts. There are a lot of accusations flying back and forth, uh, some of them falling into panic, then they get back uh, to somewhat managing the situation, then they fall back into panic again. So people are pretty nervous. Interesting, interesting. Okay, we touched upon that. Um, the next one is a propaganda role. They usually work according to some book or some guidance, right? But after this event, they are going in all different directions. Some of them are screaming, when will be the revenge? The others are saying, how long can we tolerate that? We need to find traitors among our military leadership. At some point, they will get more organized. But regardless, right now, they are reflecting the moods of the audience. Everything is shit. Yeah, yeah, that uh, discombobulation, the general discombobulation happening. And that's another sign that they don't have uh, any guidance for that reaction. They cannot, they're propagandists, right? They're media personalities, they cannot stay quiet. So they're breeding tons of different theories. If they had a planned event, if they had a joint uh, power, they would quickly be given a single version to pedal. But right now they are not, and they're breeding a ton of different versions. And why? Because the leadership is not united. And over the last 24 hours, they have not figured a single version. And I'm giving 101% that Putin is blaming his own and he's looking for guilty parts among his own. All right, that does sound like them, right? All right, among different outcomes of that, what can they, whom can they blame and what can they fall back to? They still need to point finger at somebody. So, let's think what can they retaliate uh, with. Do you think they may target critical infrastructure? With, I don't know, extreme nuclear station or center of decision making, Kiev, Bankova Street, that's standard, or whatever they call the center of decision making, they can call a kindergarten that. And uh, extreme measures, uh, they could bring tactical nuclear weapons to the front. Mark, people who cannot figure out the joint uh, news approach, the joint news message, they are not ready to use any nukes. And that does affect it, you're right, you're right. This is a collegiate decision, Minister of Defense, Head of uh, Command, President. They're not ready for that, Mark. I can kind of imagine some missiles flying into some power stations. But otherwise, people who cannot figure out a joint approach to the conflict, to the event in 24 hours, I don't believe that. So imagine um, they even try to go for the extreme version. They, I know where they'll not find a way to do it. And they'll topple at the point of making decision how to wrap it. What's the message? because they can't even figure it out about the bridge explosion. 
And if they're to use anything extreme on the front, they'll need to wrap that and present that somehow to the audience. They will not have a joint opinion on that. So something is going on there, uh, obviously struggling inside. And whatever is happening is more important for them if they will, th than if they will hold here son or other parts. You know what, let's take a look at the map. We'll just take a look at the south in that context related to the Crimean bridge because uh, the next one if I understand things right will likely be Kherson and it's at the bottom of the map at six o'clock you can see the boulder name well it's our command they're on, they are the only ones who know which one will be next uh, okay looking at that map I see a little blue a little blue area, Ternovi Podi. Mark, whenever General Commander posts that, uh, confirms that, then I'll confirm that. And regardless, even if we took that in the last two, three days, that's the only one settlement we're take, we have taken. Um, so it does appear that before that we've been taken five or seven, so there is a tactical pause. Ternovi Podi, if to speak of that blue uh, square, it's on around nine o'clock, little towards the center. This is a good place, this is a good road junction, but regardless, um, this is not the tempo we had initially. Same thing on the Svatova direction, if you scroll back up. Both sides are aggregating resources, so we'll see what will ensue. Okay, another th angle. Winter is nigh, right? Before the end of November, before December hits, many things need to change. Because it's already, what, the first decade of October is almost gone. Mark, in the next 20 days of October, many things may still happen. We don't know the amount of our reserves, we don't know the amount of their reserves. It's not even about locales and the maps, it's more about equipment, ammo and troops. So whichever side has more, more of that will be prevailing. If we have that, we'll be winning. If they have, it'll be tough for us. I do not believe they can add anything but those new mobilized people to the front. So I'm suspecting the only they can do is throw back some of the rotated uh, groups back in the front with uh, new mobilized uh, troops that were just brought to the front. And according to some intel, they're almost nearly preparing a counter-strike with these new people reinforcements. So Brave Lapin is uh, concocting some sort of operation. So we'll see. We'll see what they can do. Uh, all this... Uh, guessing on the map is not uh, a fruitful operation because one needs to know in detail where the troops are, how many of them are, and only maybe 10 people in the country have uh, detailed information about that, the full picture of the whole front. But in general, we understand that, yes, we will maintain our directional attack towards Svatova, uh, they are still trying to attack Bakhmut a little, but it's not working for them. And then it will depend upon the, the real serious big changes on the front will depend upon who will be first to bring overwhelming force to a certain direction. We don't know that yet, but we'll see it uh, on the outcome. So situation with the mobilized, the main mass of those, because they're also observing that. They hit on the Crimean bridge. Is there any data? Does it mean that uh, generally southern side will suffer in regards of resupply, restocking, and refitting the groups? Uh, and instead, they'll get they'll be able to throw more people to the eastern front. 
So I would agree, yes. Uh, first of all, they will be refitting Svatova Kriminoya Strabilska group. They already thrown these mobics to the front. As for the southern side, they the troops are not their problem. They already have about 60% of their military force from Kherson to Mariupol to Takmak. They have other problem there, logistics. They don't have enough food, they don't have enough ammo, enough equipment. So if you throw more people, it just adds more problems with logistics. One can understand the Svatova group, uh, it is being supplied directly from Russia and the supply shoulder is only about 60 kilometers, about 50 miles. So. As for the south, you can bring more troops, but then you need more fuel, more stuff, more water, everything. Oh, and monetary, of course. Do they need that? That's the next question. Do they need to strain an overstrained front already? You know that Surovikin has been appointed the uh, head of that special military operation, and before that he was in charge of Direction South, the Southern Front, Kherson and everything. I don't know how overall that decision will affect the South, because um, they will replace him with somebody on the Southern Front. Mark, they're already doing the defense operation. They're not about offensive anymore. And Ministry of Defense of Russia changed their tone and now they're doing successful defensive operations on the occupied territories. And some people are also sending me notes that uh, our partisans are still working, that uh, railroad from Jankoy, uh, the one that uh, supplies ammo and everything and uh, logistical supplies to Kherson region uh, has been broken. So supplies are not going by railroad anymore. Then there is another uh, airport that we had, two TU-22s, the strategic ones. They had 27s on that airport, but uh, only less than 20 flew out or 22 tops. I would tell you that seven or nine destroyed strategic bombers. This is uh, monetary and other value-wise worth of probably two Moscow cruisers or two Crimean bridges. They're not up to offensive. They're really barely holding their defensive now. There are different things that they're not talking about. So there are more successful operations happening on the front. So. That explosion on the bridge, it does have an effect, but it, it's not the main event overall. And we'll see in a few days, we'll see if that does affect the logistics supply to a degree we predict. We have 300,000 uh, people watching us live, over 140,000 click the like button. We've been live for about uh, 33 minutes, so please uh, once again and ask, share the links to that stream on your social media and the forums everywhere you hang out. Make sure your uh, friends and people who need to see that do see that. And perhaps, you know, if, uh, if they cannot catch that stream live, they can join us uh, later in the recorded broadcast. And of course, subscribe to Fagin Live, to Alexei Arstovich and to the Privateer Station. Your subscriptions do affect uh, how this video is being promoted within the YouTube's algorithms, so please uh, help us with that. Okay, another news, they are confirming that Kremlin resources are stating that the first train after the accident, uh, it's a passenger train, but it did uh, succeed in uh, getting through the bridge. It's difficult to estimate the damage to the tracks, but in any case, uh, there is one automobile lane that will likely be used in reverse mode, and the rest will be, they'll be repairing it for a while. All right, in your opinion, you think the bridge will not feel well in the future? 
Do you think it will suffer a little? Of course, Mark, I would want to say that, uh, yeah, it will only get worse from here, but first of all, we don't know if we were responsible for that. I have certain doubts looking at certain parameters that we discussed today. And second, at some point it was considered to be a sac sacred object and, you know, untouchable and everything. They said that uh, you'll be faced f with a judgment day if you destroy or attack the bridge. Uh, same thing with Crimea, remember, when they talked about that, like, we, Crimea is ours. You can liberate your occupied territories back, but Crimea will ever be Russian. And overall, they're basically both losing, all, both of these items are losing their sacred value. That's the result of Putin's politics. Times change, statuses change. I definitely afford or allow for second, third, fourth, a hundredth explosion of that bridge. But we'll see. We'll see what happens. All right. Um, Turkish publication uh, just posted something that they are eager to partake in uh, negotiations between Ukraine and Moscow. Uh, yeah, there's another interesting angle I've read in the media that Putin is uh, getting ready to propose a new contract to the West. So my question to that would be, why? Your army is destroyed, your economy is at zero, you don't know if you will live the other month, your flagship just sunk in uh, the Black Sea in the last half a year. What peace do you want to conclude? What do you want to trade for? You're not trading from the position of power. Uh, to expect that your gas and everything will affect the West, so they would crawl back and talk to him. What can he offer to the West? What, in principle? Well, let's think. He can come back to them and say, I will not use nukes. What else? What does it change for the West? Um, I would say nothing. I cannot gauge it from the full Western perspective. Well, Mark, can he stop the economic recession in the West? Can he restart gas supplies? Maybe. Um, can he, he... He basically lost a lot of things, and then he's out to conclude to make a new contract. It would have been smarter to not start, because uh, de facto they were acknowledging Russian sovereignty of, over Crimea, Donbass, there were questions. Elon Musk, uh, albeit late, is trying to reinform us about that again. And now he is in a much weaker position. And from that, uh, from that start, with uh, such a bad hand to start to do a new contract, I don't see how... I understand Turks are planning to uh, keep their position higher in the region. And by the way, Indonesian government did uh, and pub pub leaked through publications that both Russia and Ukraine are going to be visiting the G20 summit, but it, it is not approved by neither Russia nor Ukraine. Interesting. By the way, Zelensky never left Ukraine, right, uh, during the war? So why would he all of a sudden in November leave Ukraine and fly to Bali? Yeah, right? He can easily make a statement online. We've seen him doing it. And to solve any important questions, you know, people can come to Kiev and talk to him. Or he can send people, he can send ambassadors and, you know, Yermak was going to Germany and Turkey and other places. Uh, in Turkey, he met uh, Bayraktar Manufacturing and he met, uh, organized a meeting with uh, relatives of uh, Azov rescued fighters. And he was also meeting with representatives of uh, leadership. Uh, he met advisor with to the Turkish president who has this relatively similar status that he does. So these questions are often uh, resolved by non-public diplomacy. Whenever you need to resolve something, you don't need a sum to call a summit to do that. Summit is a place where people say 
the right words and discuss the open agenda and things that you can bring up in front of numbers of people. If president needs to address somebody, he can find another way. I think he can, and it's my opinion, he can decide for himself, but I think he can totally make his speech online. But you see, there are people eager to announce a possible diplomatic success and capitalize on that. All right, the last thing today, let's uh, discuss what else Ukraine lacks in terms of military munitions. Overall, looking at a bigger picture, we understand what uh, you guys need to promote and to ease the operations in the south and in the east and things that can affect uh, the events after the occupation of the right bank of Dnieper river looking at the Kharkov operation right left banks of Askol river what in your mind and what uh, do you think is uh, absolutely important what can play the most vital role in the future events do you think uh, anti-air defense mark let me say that in general for sure i can say that there'll be more and they'll be faster is it for sure yeah that is confirmed do you have any time frame more and faster okay all right, I've been live for 42 minutes today, uh, about 542,000 people watched us at the top, 160,000 clicked the like button, big ask please share links to that stream in your social media and groups, click the like button, it uh, does help us to get uh, our streams to the tops of YouTube, we usually do, but uh, that's only to due to your effort. And subscribe to Fagin Live. We are at almost 1 million, uh, 800,000. There is still a lot of you that are watching us without subscription. That definitely helps. And of course, channel of Alexei Rostovich, uh in the description and to the privateer station if you are listening to that or watching it in English. Tomorrow you cannot, right? Tomorrow is Sunday. Okay, then on Monday, a day after tomorrow, we're meeting Alexei. Uh, please do not skip our stream on Monday, 10 p.m., the usual. Thank you, everybody, and uh, see you. Goodbye. See you day after tomorrow.